Let's continue. Chapter 9, Part 1 describes a desperate search for the tale cut short at the end of Chapter 8. On the other hand, as we have seen elsewhere, the passage suggests a deeper quest for Manchegan identity. Cervantes maintains the comic touch of his free indirect style, linking the narrator's naive mindset as well as his antiquated usage to those of Don Quixote in his fight with the Basque. At the very least, they would have divided and severed Fenderian each other from top to bottom, opening themselves up like a pomegranate, Granada. Moreover, the suspense has so affected the narrator that it is as if his hero has been defeated. This distressed me greatly, and I could not incline myself to believe that such a gallant tale had been left maimed and mutilated. This last detail perhaps alludes to Cervantes himself, who bore the moniker the one-armed man of Lepanto for having lost the use of his left hand in the famous battle between the Holy League and the Turkish Empire in 1571. And finally, given the southerly course we have been tracing, the allusion to a pomegranate, Granada, in the first sentence of chapter 9 may refer to the last Moorish kingdom that was reconquered in 1492 and then incorporated symbolically as a fruit at the bottom of the shield of the kings of Spain. Recalling our novel as the first parody of literary criticism, it is interesting that the narrator adopts a philological perspective, noting that Don Quixote's story must be modern because among his books had been found several as recent as The Deception of Jealousy and Nymphs and Shepherds of Enades. At the same time, however, the book takes on a medieval appearance when the narrator describes it as the life and miracles of Don Quixote. And finally, at the end of the preamble to the discovery of the lost manuscript, we are treated to a long disquisition on women whom Don Quixote has always wanted to protect and each of whom had she been properly defended against the giants, villains, and other rapists who threatened her could have gone to the grave just as virginal as the mother who gave birth to her. What? How can a mother be a virgin? The obsession with the impossible virginity of certain women, which the first narrator shares with Don Quixote, is comical. But if we recall the merchants of Toledo, it is also a major theme. Let's turn to the discovery of the lost manuscript. Where is it? In the Alcana, the central market of Toledo ironically enough, in the form of papers about to be sold to a silk dealer. In other words, the manuscript was destined to be eaten by the worms that made the raw material used by the silk industry introduced to southern Spain by the Moors, an industry about to be destroyed by the expulsion of the Moriscos between 1609 and 1614. The text that the narrator finds has Arabic characters, and so, irony of ironies, he then has to find a Morisco who speaks Castilian in order to translate it. What we have here is a description of Toledo as a radically cosmopolitan city, for the narrator tells us that it was easy to find a translator, adding that he could have found one for another better, even older language, meaning Hebrew. There's also the shadow of something tragic and irreverent here. Toledo's inquisitional tribunal was relatively savage, and only a few chapters ago, Cervantes was mocking the institution's protocols. Suddenly, there's a burst of laughter from the Morisco translator, and after reading a little bit of it, he began to laugh. What is he laughing at? Something written in the margin. They say that this Dulcinea del Toboso, so often mentioned in this story, had the best hand at salting pork of any woman in all of La Mancha. The famous Spanish obsession with ham derived from the need on the part of religious converts to demonstrate their rejection of Judaism's and Islam's prescriptions against its consumption. Recall our two previous reflections on laughter. Is the Morisco's laughter sadistic or humble? At the very least, he laughs at a public attempt to express racial purity in a place as historically and ethnically transitory as La Mancha. And this laughter has to remind us of the prostitutes in front of the castle, I mean al Kafar, I mean in, in chapter 2. At that time, getting laughed at made Don Quixote angry. How does the narrator react here? Not with anger. He's too excited about his good fortune at having discovered the continuation of his favorite story. What's more, if he wants to get a deal, he has to focus on containing his joy 
By the way, the Morisco translator's laughter contextualizes our first encounter with the alleged author of the original manuscript, an Arab historian, Fide Amete Benengeli. We'll deal with him later. For now, notice how deeply Cervantes delves into the bourgeois world. Describing how he achieved the translation of the manuscript, the narrator even gives us a brief lesson on the subjective theory of value. It required much discretion to hide the joy I felt when the title of the book reached my ears, and jumping in front of the silk dealer, I bought from the young man all his papers and pamphlets for half a real, for if he had any discretion and found out how much I really wanted them, he could easily have sold them to me for six reales. It sure looks as if our Christian narrator has tricked an Arabic merchant. But that's what makes a market, right? A coming together of two asymmetrical estimations of value. This whirlwind of cultural and economic exchanges continues. I then stole away with my Morisco to the cloister of the main cathedral, and I begged him to transform all those pamphlets that related to Don Quixote into Spanish. This time, the narrator is not stingy, offering to pay him whatever he wanted, although the Morisco is satisfied with two drafts of raisins and two measures of wheat, and promised to translate them well and faithfully and with all dispatch. The narrator still gives him room and board for an extended period. So as to better facilitate the business and not to let such a great find slip through my fingers, I brought him into my home, where in little over a month and a half, he translated the whole story. Here, it's hard not to think of the conflicts that arise at so many of the novel's ends. And contemplate this, from Toledo's al Cana to the cloister of its cathedral to the narrator's home, the encounter between a Christian and a Morisco takes a symbolic route, perhaps even a dangerous one, if we remember that they are carrying an Arabic text through the streets of inquisitional Spain. And we not only face a textual interruption, after all, the discovery of the lost manuscript involves an impressive case of ekphrasis, a long textual description of an object of visual art. All of it very funny, right down to the detail of Sancho clutching the halter of his ass. There are so many textual and visual frames here that it's hard not to get completely lost. And on top of all this, we have to confront the question of whether or not Cide Amete is trustworthy. The narrator, who has just celebrated his successful negotiation with the Morisco translator, criticizes Amete, calling him a galgo, or greyhound, for not praising Don Quixote sufficiently, it being rather typical of that nation to be liars. Can you get any more hypocritical than this? Madre mía, I almost forgot. What a cliffhanger. What happened between Don Quixote and the Basque? It's easy to conclude that nothing, really, but the truth is that Don Quixote lost much of his helmet and armor on his left side, and also half his ear, another detail we'll have to look at later. Don Quixote answers by delivering a huge blow, swinging his sword with both hands, and the enemy's fate is worse. He began to bleed from his nose and from his mouth and ears. Given what we know about early modern medicine, the Basque's prognosis is not good. This episode is among the most violent in the novel. Moreover, Don Quixote is about to kill his enemy. Putting the tip of his sword between his eyes, he told him to surrender. If not, he would cut off his head. And since the Basque Hidalgo cannot answer, he would have come to a bad end. So blinded with rage was Don Quixote. Only the pleas of the beauteous ladies of the carriage spare his life. One of the novel's major themes, the antidote to male anger is almost always female intervention. To summarize, at this point, the novel is characterized by narrative breaks, each more complex than the last. Don Quixote wakes up in the middle of the burning of his books, then, following a southerly geographical and linguistic trajectory, our Castilian hero confronts primordial Basque nobles on their way to the modern bustle of Seville. Meanwhile, the narrator surveys the Alcana of Toledo and haggles with a morisco over the translation of a lost manuscript. Goodness, the symbolic windmill has yielded dizzying results. Perhaps the human experience always revolves around some unfathomable business. Still, said business can be either destructive or productive. 
In other words, violent exploitation or peaceful exchange. Perhaps these options are the inevitable results of our contradictory nature. So, are we just dust in the wind or are we more like flowers?